I would like to present something from uh, particle physics, which is slightly different. So we are going to to the micro world, so far away from cosmological solution that uh, we heard just recently. So the conformal standard model. Since now we know that we know that the standard model, which is a perfectly, uh, it's tested up to 12 digits. Uh, and there are no measured deviations from the standard model. So it is an extremely successful theory. But on the other hand, we know it's, the, it's not the final world. Since there is no gravity, first of all, it's just, there are just two interactions, electroweak and strong. And secondly, there, are, there is a theoretical limit to this, a Planck mass, where the gravitational interactions start to be as strong as other interactions. And most of physicists are absolutely convinced that when gravity becomes strong, it should be quantized, because otherwise it's inconsistent to add uh, strong gravity, which is classical, to uh, strong interactions or electroweak interactions, which are quantum. And th there are, even below Planck mass, there are several problems that I call non-gravitational problems of the standard model, namely the hierarchy problem, that is slight theoretical problem, but I will discuss this in detail in a minute. Strong CP problem, that the problem why the neutron electric dipole moment is very, very small. It's up, there is only an upper bound, and it should be roughly 10 to the 10 times larger if one uses the naive expectation. So one can add to the standard model a term that is consistent with all the symmetries of the standard model, and still it induces the neutron dipole mo moment, which is far, far too large in comparison with observations. There is, cold dark, there is no cold dark matter candidate here. So, and we know cold dark matter should be there. So uh, none of the particles of the standard model is a good cold dark matter candidate. And there is matter-antimatter asymmetry. We are here, so we know that there is matter-antimatter asymmetry. And the asymmetry that is possible within the standard model that comes from the phase of the Kabibo-Kobayashi-Moskawa matrix is far too small. It's at least four orders of magnitude too small to explain the uh, uh, observed matter-antimatter asymmetry. So those are, let's say, deficiencies, theoretical or observational deficiencies of the standard model that we have to explain. So we have to enlarge the standard model anyway. Of course, the most, uh, for decades, we have the enlargement in the form of supersymmetry. I will discuss this in a minute. I want to propose something different, much, much simpler than supersymmetry, by the way. The real challenge in the present theory are gravitational, quote unquote, problems. Values of the constants, we have absolutely no clue why electron mass is what it is, uh, what, why are the couplings what they are, and so on and so forth. Without that, it was emphasized several times, we wouldn't be here, but there is no explanation, there is no equation for values of the con constants of the standard model. They are just measured quantities. We have absolutely no clue to say anything about uh, whether we can explain them, or whether they are solutions of some equations or not. The other thing is, of course, the Newton's constant. That's the problem why gravity is so weak. Of course, that's also, if it wasn't so weak, we know the Chandrasekhar limit the sun would not have 10 to the 60 protons, but would have, for example, 100 protons if gravity was equally strong as other interactions. And we would, of course, collapse immediately after, after being built out of four protons, for example, and not to have 10 to 26 protons as we are now. So that's absolutely unexplained by anything, why gravity is so weak, but it's extremely important for us that it is. Cosmological constant, whether it is a constant or it is not a constant, it's still debatable, but it's something that is beyond the particle part of the problem. Whether there was or there wasn't initial singularity, that is also something that does not belong to the particle uh, physics 
problems that should be solved in, in more general theory. Uh, this quantum gravity. Criticality of the universe is one of the problems that is used to be solved by inflation, but whether inflation was there or not, what is the origin of inflation, whether it is gravitational or particle physics. In particle <laughs> physics, we usually do not have any candidate for an inflaton, so it is not clear whether it is part of the particle physics or the unified theory, this more general theory, future of the universe. Those are problems that I will not intend to solve by this proposal. So those are outside of the proposal, to be, to be, to be clear. Only these particle physics problems that I think belong to particle physics and does, do not have to invoke gravity. That's the part that I want to solve by this proposal. So the assumptions. The standard model should be enlarged as little as possible. So we want to solve all these problems with very mild, the smallest set of new fields as possible. Uh, we know that neutrinos are massive. Now it is, seems to be beyond doubt. Therefore, we know that there should be right chiron neutrinos in the theory. That's not an enlargement of the standard model. Standard model should have right chiral neutrinos because neutrinos are massive. So, and we impose the seesaw mechanism for neutrinos. But that is always implied now, so it's not. There's a spontaneous breaking of local SU2 cross U1, so the standard broad angular Higgs mechanism. So we don't change it at all. It's very successful. And we spontaneously break the global lepton symmetry. We assume that there is a global lepton symmetry in the model and that it is spontaneously broken. And that's one of the pieces that is needed to explain matter-antimatter asymmetry. That's global breaking of le lepton symmetry. And the model is viable up to the Planck scale without any new scales between us and the Planck scale. So this is grand desert in a sense. But Grand Desert, this name, implies that there is a huge distance between us and the Planck scale. What I want to show is that in this model, everything runs logarithmically. Therefore, it is not a Grand Desert, because 10 to the 17 is a large number when we compare the scale of the weak, the weak scale and the Planck scale. When we take the logarithm, if everything runs very mildly, it's not that far away. Of course, the cost of an accelerator runs like as 10 to the 17. So it's a problem to really measure it or check it. But from the theoretical point, the scale is very, very close to us. And what I want to, um, in a sense, propose is what we see around is the physics also at the Planck scale with logarithmic corrections. There is nothing else. So, because any scale in between that is usually proposed, the grand unified theories, for example, or some compactification scale, they uh, completely shield us away from the view at the Planck scale. So with some intermediate scale, we cannot say anything about the Planck scale because we can engineer everything at this intermediate scale. But not in this model. In this model, we assume that what we see here is what we would see at the Planck scale. Uh, but not above. And that all the non-gravitational problems are solved. Of course, I have nothing to say about the gravitational problems in this model. OK, what is the model? In this, under these assumptions, as I will show, on top of the Higgs particle, there should be one complex scalar. It is absolutely necessary in the model. So there is a real part of the scalar and the imaginary part of the scalar. The real part of the scalar is something that mixes with the Higgs. So the prediction, absolute prediction of the model that LHC should see another quote unquote Higgs. So there should be another scalar particle. It is necessary. While the imaginary part of the model is an axion. We have shown that this couples very, very weakly not by construction, but it couples very, very weakly because neutrinos are very light. We don't know why neutrinos are very light, but if they are very light, 
the imaginary part of this, the phase of this scalar couples extremely weakly to other particles, and it can be a cold dark matter candidate. So it's by, by construction we have a cold dark matter candidate that couples very weakly. I will discuss the axon in a minute. So its real part mixes with the usual Higgs, so we have two mass eigenstates. So in this model, what has been found at LHC is not a pure doublet, it's part of, we assume that generically they mix, it has a, a part of it is the doublet, part of it is the new scalar. So that's, that's the, that's in this model is, is necessary. Its phase is a pseudo Goldstone boson. Axion solves the strong CP problem. So we have the, one of the non-gravitational problems is solved uh, by construction. We, we have shown that it couples to, to gluons in such a way that it solves the strong CP problem and is the cold dark matter candidate because its mass is roughly around 10 to the minus 8 electron volts. And that is something that can, solve, that can be cold. Uh, okay. And there exists a range of parameters that, satisfy, that satisfies all the assumptions. And what I want to show is that it is not the case for the standard model. So these assumptions that we make are not satisfied by the pure standard model. So it has to be enlarged. <sighs> Hierarchy problem, one of the problems that is extremely important that was the origin of all the developments of supersymmetry. Supersymmetry was motivated by the hierarchy problem. So the question is, why masses in the standard model are so much smaller than any cutoff scale, Planck scale or grand unified scale? Why is it so much smaller? So that's the problem. And the, as we know, the usual solution is the supersymmetry. But LHC doesn't seem to particularly like supersymmetry because all the bounds are pushed up and up now, there, of course, LHC doesn't work, so we have to wait till next March to start. But there, are not, there is no single slightest hint for supersymmetry in the, result, in the results of, of LHC, so maybe one should look for alternatives. Uh, therefore, in this model, we treat the cutoff scale of the order of Planck scale as a real physical scale. So that's not the usual approach in quantum field theory. In quantum field theory, we calculate the whatever amplitudes or whatever, uh, coupling constants, as a function of the cutoff. Then we send cutoff to infinity. We introduce bare masses and bare couplings equal to minus infinity to cancel this infinity. And therefore, we don't have any dependence on the cutoff. Therefore, we introduce some renormalization scale mu, and we say nothing should depend on mu. That's the usual renormalization problem, mm, program in the quantum field theory. In our case, we treat the cutoff scale as a real physical scale. So we assume that above this scale, there are some gravitational degrees of freedom that we don't know anything about, so that they are this is a real scale, and we should define our theory that we have uh, at low energies at this scale, because that's the defining scale for our theory. That's our assumption. So the unknown degrees of freedom above this cutoff, above the Planck scale, whether it is string theory or whatever, we don't know. But what is left behind is an effective theory that has only known degrees of freedom, that are defined at lambda, and everything else is integrated over. That's our assumption. So we make an assumption about an effective theory at the scale lambda, so we don't send lambda to infinity. Everything is a function of lambda. Of course, we have to, the hierarchy problem is a question, again, the same question, why the masses of the standard model are so much lower than lambda? But that's a slightly different question than in the usual renormalization program. So, okay, we, if we calculate in any uh, quantum field theory uh, how the effective couplings run, we have that the dimensionless couplings 
run logarithmically. There is no hierarchy problem for dimensionless couplings. They run logarithmically, we don't have to do anything with it. In our case, we assume that bare quantities are not infinite, as is usual in, in quantum field theory, but they are finite and they are defined so bare at the scale lambda is renormalized at the scale lambda because we defined a theory at the scale lambda. So they don't go to infinity. They are the definition constants at the scale lambda plus, some, plus logarithmic corrections. If mu is equal to lambda, they all cancel out. So this is something what we have. But for dimension full quantities, that's the source of the problem in the standard model in, in any quantum field theory are dimension full, uh, dimension full parameters. So in the standard model, there is one dimension full uh, parameter that is minus m squared doublet squared. And this is the source of all the problems of the standard model because for dimension full parameters, they have no, some renormalized quantity, some logarithmic corrections, but also there is something proportional to lambda squared. And to kill this f is the motivation for supersymmetry, to, in a sense, explain why this f is zero. But when we actually do this, it turns out that this coefficient in front is something that depends, is a one function of lambda b, of the bare parameter, just one function. So what we need is that this function is zero at lambda, that the only requirement that we have to impose not to have the hierarchy problem. The supersymmetry has this as identically zero, not at one point, but for all scales. So the solution of the of supersymmetrical solution of the hierarchy problem is to put this to zero independently of mu and lambda and lambda r. It is just zero, identically zero. In our case, since we don't have supersymmetry, this is a function, and we assume that this function at the scale lambda has one zero, but this zero is enough to solve the hierarchy problem. So we have additional constraint on all the couplings. Of course, it's an assumption. We should check it when we have all the parameters, whether it is zero or it isn't zero. And this thing for the standard model is not zero at the lambda. So it does not solve. So pure standard model does not solve the hierarchy problem. If we plug in the values of the coupling constants, we know all of them now all Yukawa or the uh, value of the mm, uh, top quark mass and so on and so forth, when we plug it into this expression, it is not zero. Uh, okay. So let's propose the name for this, softly broken conformal symmetry, SBCS for short, that a theory solving the hierarchy problem has to satisfy. First of all, all these functions independent functions should be equal to zero at the defining scale. Second, so that there are no quadratic divergence in the theory. All masses should be much less than lambda. That's also an assumption. If this is true, if they are defined at the scale lambda as small, they will remain small to all the scales. And, sec and the third thing, there are no Landau poles or instabilities in the theory for any scale between electroweak scale and the Planck scale. Those are three requirements. And the standard model, pure standard model, does not satisfy this and does not satisfy this. It turns out that it starts to be unstable. The pure standard model is unstable above 10 to the 10 GeV. So it is not it does not belong to this class. So in this conformal standard model that I will describe in a minute um, in more detail, all conditions are non-trivial. Therefore, we have to impose parameters at the Planck scale. Uh, in supersymmetry, this is zero identically at all scales, so we don't have to impose this as a separate condition, but the fact that masses have to be much smaller than lambda, has to be imposed separately. 
We know that in the softly broken supersymmetry we have mu terms, a terms, and we just impose that they are much smaller than the, than the Planck scale, let's say. So that is uh, an assumption that this has to be made separately. Next, in theory, without scalars, like pure QED or pure QCD, there are no quadratic divergences by construction, because if we have only fermions and vector bosons, there are no quadratic divergences. So these functions, these Fs, are uh, zero. They are, they are not there. So they automatically belong to this class. Only scalars uh, can uh, produce problems for us. Of course, if there are no Landau poles, because also in these theories there can be Landau poles. We know that in QED, it's some, uh, some ridiculously large value, there is also a Landau pole for the, for, the, for the charge. But if there are no Landau poles, there are no problems. So this is the class that we propose to check whether a given theory belongs to this class to solve the hierarchy problem. So in our case, the conformal standard model is just the standard model plus right chiral neutrinos, that is standard. And since right chiral neutrinos carry lepton number, we have to add here a field, because otherwise we would break, usually in the CISO mechanism, one writes this plus lar large M in front. But if we have large M in front, they carry the lepton number. I would like to emphasize that there is a transpose and not bar here. Therefore, it is something that carries the lepton number. So we have to introduce a field that carries minus two lepton number so that this piece is invariant. Therefore, we have additional complex field. So that's the usual standard model, coupling to right chiral neutrinos that is standard in the CISO mechanism. But we can add the something that does not break the so additional terms in the, in the, in the potential and additional terms for the mass. So the assumptions are such that this, we assume, is of order one. This is of order 10 to the minus six, uh, because we want to have the CISO, so we have to explain that neutrinos are below one electron volt. But the 10 to the minus six in not, is not very unnatural, because I would like to recall that electron U kava, that is known, that is measured, is 10 to the minus six. So that is just of the order of the electron U kava, this matrix. So that we have the CISO, neutrino masses are below one electron volts. This complex scalar is necessary because of the lepton number. And we assume that all the masses, this, those are dimensionful parameters, this, and the expectation value of those are all at the electroweak scale. So we don't have any other scale than 100 GeV, let's say. That's the only scale present in the model. Okay, so the question is how I can explain, for example, the smallness of the axion coupling. Usually in the axion physics, one says that the coupling is of the order of 10 to the 12 GeV, uh, the scale. So how can I get to 10 to the 12 GeV starting from one scale 100 GeV? And I will show that it's absolutely natural in the model because all these scales are generated by MW divided by the neutrino mass. Since neutrino mass is below one electron volt, we gain 10 to the 11 for nothing, just out of construction. Okay. So the particle content is standard model with very light neutrinos, something that we know very well plus heavy neutrinos, the right chiral neutrinos that are of the order of one TeV, plus a complex new scalar. That's everything that we have. Uh, we invoke braut engler higgs mechanism for electroweak symmetry breaking, so that the usual stuff, so that three Higgses are, are eaten by the longitudinal components of W plus, minus, and Z. And there is a spontaneous symmetry breaking, it's not this mechanism, of the lepton number symmetry. So we have a Goldstone theorem that says that the phase should be massless, should be very, very light. Uh, and this phase is actually comes from the global lepton number symmetry, because phi 
transforms under the usual lepton number symmetry. Uh, in this, let's look at what are these function f that we have to impose on the model so that there are no quadratic divergences. I emphasize that we impose it at the Planck scale because Weltmann, for example, long time ago imposed it on at the electroweak scale and he predicted the value of the top mass which was completely wrong because it was not imposed at the Planck scale. Okay, so those are two conditions. For the standard model, there would be no condition of this sort because that corresponds to the second scalar and there would be no lambda three. And actually that would be, and when we check for the standard model, we know all the components here and when we uh, run the components from the weak scale to the Planck scale, it turns out that this function, six lambda plus this plus this minus this, is not equal to zero at the Planck scale. So standard model does not solve by itself the uh, uh, hierarchy problem. Moreover, uh, for axion mass we don't have anything because it's a Goldstone boson. So we don't have to impose anything in front because uh, it doesn't have any corrections to its mass. So it's massless and doesn't have any corrections. Uh, in the standard model, this thing is not zero at the Planck scale. There is, of course, no F2. Moreover, there is a second problem in the standard model. When we run, lambda 1 starts to be negative above 10 to the 10 electro, uh, GeV. Therefore, the model, the potential starts to be unstable. So the standard model has to be, from this point of view, it has to be enlarged. It is, the standard model by itself cannot be the final, final story. While in, in this case, we can impose both this and this, and when we run the couplings, all of them are small and positive. So nothing happens in this model uh, with this small enlargement by another uh, scalar field. I will show the running in a minute. So at the minimum of the potential, the mass eigenstates consist of, in generically, consist of a, f a mixture of the Higgs, the usual Higgs, doublet, and the new scalar. Therefore, these mixed have, uh, the, the, those are the mixtures with masses MH and M phi, and in this approach, what has been found at the LHC is this mixture with this mass. So looking, if LHC was not a hadron machine, but was electron-positron machine, so we could look precisely at 125 GeV, what is the structure of the resonance, we would know whether it is a mixture or it isn't. But since it is a hadron machine, which is very dirty and it's very difficult to gather information. You have to have extremely large statistics to cover this. We know that, the, for example, the cross-section for the production and the decay rates are known rather poorly. So we cannot say now whether this Higgs is a pure doublet or it is a mixture of a doublet with some cosine of beta of the doublet and something else. So therefore, we cannot answer the question whether it is so, whether this model, it could be falsified by now if it was an electron machine and not the Hadron machine, but it isn't. There is also a phase of this new scalar axion, which is an, uh, in, uh, in first approximation, it is massless. So those are new particles. So in comparison with supersymmetry, when all the particles have their partners, like photinos, vinos, binos, xenos, hexinos, and so on, it is much, much simpler, I would say. And there are only three new parameters here. I recall that in the simplest supersymmetric model, MSSM, there are 116 new parameters in, in the standard model. Here there are three, and actually one. I will show the plot that it is actually knowing one thing, namely the mass of, the, of this, this mass, and if, if, it, if it is discovered and we know this, we'll know almost everything about the model. So it is fully falsifiable, this model. So we, of course, impose the condition that this 
is 125 GV, that the expectation value of this, of the, of the doublet, is 246, because we want to explain the masses of W and Z, so these numbers are very well known. And all couplings remain small and positive between this and this, and that gives us the conditions on these new couplings. So the self-couplings of this, of this new scalar, because there's only a small window within which they remain small and positive. So in a sense, we can fix them almost. The running coupling constant, that's one of the solutions. That's the usual lambda one, so that the self-coupling of the uh, Higgs. In the pure standard model, it looks like this, that it goes below zero and goes back, and somewhere here it hits zero. So. So that's the evolution. So it starts, the usual standard model is unstable from 10 to the 10 electron volts from here, roughly. Those are the other couplings. That's the um, Yukawa of the right car neutrinos. We see that over 17 orders of magnitude, nothing happens. It's just small, positive, nothing happens. This model is just extendable up to the Planck scale. Uh, so. So to look for lambda 2, lambda 3, we have scant over possible values, and we impose the condition that all three of them, all, all the coupling constants should stay small and positive. So there was uh, a narrow set of values, but not extremely narrow. It's not something that we had to look for many years to find a set of values. It is narrow, but not very narrow. We impose the condition that the tangent of the mixing angle is not too large, because we know that the cross-section that is already measured by ATLAS and CMS is not very far away from the standard model. And this cross-section should have cosine squared of beta. So in a sense, we impose additionally that the mixture is not too big, so that the already found Higgs is almost uniquely the doublet with cosine of beta. So we have a two-parameter space, actually, because we imposed also the conditions at the Planck scale. So the width of the Higgs, something that we call Higgs, so this H0, is the usual standard model time cosine squared of beta, plus the possibility that H0 dec decays into two axioms. So that is new with respect to the standard model, because in the standard model, Higgs decays only into the standard model particles. The other one, the heavier one, has, of course, the sine squared of beta, so it is much narrower than the usual Higgs, so it would be much more difficult to find. Therefore, it is not excluded by the present data because they assumed that it is the standard model Higgs without this addition. Uh, plus the possibility that this scalar decays into two or three Higgses, depending on the kinematical values, it can be only two or, th or so three, can decay into two axions, and can decay, depending on the values, on two right chiral neutrinos. But if we know the, that, the, that the sketch of the predicted scalar and heavy neutrino masses, that the tangent beta starting from zero, this is 0 0.1, it's on only negative are, are allowed, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and we have stopped searching at 0 0.3. So if the scalar is discovered, for example, at 0 0.8, 800 GeV, it almost uniquely gives us the value of the tangent beta, because it's almost horizontal. We cannot predict the value of the right chiral neutrinos, because they can be anything, but the tangent beta allows us to predict all the branching ratios, all the decay rates, so everything is there. So either it is confirmed or it isn't. So it is fully falsifiable. With supersymmetry with 116 parameters, you can always correct some of them to make it more... Um, uh, not always. With gluinos, it is not so easy, but, but otherwise it, you can always play with it. Here you cannot. Once it is found, and the mass is known, tangent beta is known, and all the decay rates, everything, branching ratios, are calculable. So that's, that's the model. Axion. Axion is a very important particle because we want to solve two problems, namely a uh, strong CP problem, and second, we want to have a dark matter candidate. Since we claim 
that this is the only, that this is the theory that extends to the Planck scale, we have to pro propose a da called dark matter candidate. Therefore, this is an axiom which is naturally in the model. It turns out that it's everything is calculable, so we can calculate couplings of axions to anything. For example, coupling of an axion to two photons is in the form of the anomaly, but it's not anomalous, it's just the usual two-loop diagram, and it turns out to be extremely small. So, it just so happens that I'm a spokesman of one of the CERN experiments looking for axions, and then we can after maybe 40 years, we can reach 10 to the minus 11, GeV to minus 1 here. So it is far beyond any existing and planned experiments within the theory. So, and this coupling is something that is used by all experiments to look for axions. So we put the uh, laser light or whatever in the magnetic field, and then we have a direct conversion axion photon. That's the way of looking. Uh, present experiments are, uh, give much below 10 to the minus 10, so we are far away from, from this value. Uh, there is an experiment, very spectacular one, made at CERN now by Oscar experiment. Namely, we have two cavities and we have very strong uh, laser light that propagates back and forth. And there is some probability that one of the photons will get converted to axion. Axion goes through the wall. Uh, at, uh, at CERN, there is a test hall which is extremely well suited for this experiment because there is a string of magnets, a wall with all the helium pipes and so on, and a second string of magnets. So we are using exactly this to, for this experiment. And then there is a probability that it gets reconverted into a photon on the other side. So we have a detector in a completely black blinded cavity with detector which is tuned to the frequency of the laser. So there is no, let's say, fake photons. There is all, only a dark count that we have to take into account, which is a very big problem. Okay, but so that is, that is the axion experiment. Also, axion gluon coupling, we have calculated that it couples to gluons like it should to solve the strong CP problem. So it couples like A trace GG dual. And the coupling, that is in the usual axion uh, proposals, well, from starting from Wilczek and Weinberg, the proposal is that this FA, they have proposed it to be of the order of a weak scale. Very soon it turned out that it's much too large, this coupling, so they have introduced FA much bigger, like 10 to the 12 GeV, called it an invisible axion. In our case, we wanted to calculate because we, don't, we cannot play with numbers. Everything is calculable. So we have calculated this. It's a three-loop calculation. And it turned out that at one point, the axion has to convert from right chiral neutrinos to left chiral neutrinos. And that costs mass of the neutrino divided by MW. And that is 10 to the minus 11. And that gives us a huge scale, even if we start from, a very, from only weak scales. That is because neutrinos are so light. Of course, we don't know why they are so light, but if they are so light, this FA is huge. It's 10 to the 16. Uh, okay, so that, is, that happened to be... Uh, the, and if we have a very light axion, then we know that condensates of gluons produce mass for the axion, which is of the order lambda QCD squared divided by this FA. Yes, if we take the, this squared. It is of the order of 10 to the minus 8 electron volts, and we know that it is the, let's say, the mm, minimal value so that the axion can be a cold dark matter candidate, but it is within the limit because at the time of QCD phase transition, the diameter or the radius of the causally connected region was roughly 100 meters. So delta P, which was bigger than that, so the lambda which was bigger than that stays, and lambda that is smaller than that is gets diluted. Therefore, delta P, which is 10, 100 meters, corresponds to 10 to the minus 8 electron volts. So if mass of the 
uh, axion is bigger than 10 to the minus 8 roughly, it's called dark matter. If it was smaller, it would be relativistic dark matter that is excluded. So it is a very good candidate for called dark matter. Summary. The, uh, this conformal standard model satisfies this so, uh, softly broken conformal symmetry. Standard model doesn't. Solves the non-gravitational problems of the SM. Here are his strong CP called dark matter. It can be viable up to the Planck scale, as we have seen. If it is true, we see the Planck scale physics around us. Because that's the same model, only with logarithmically, uh, thank you, logarithmically uh, corrected um, parameters. Uh, it has absolutely unique predictions for LHC. So if it finds the new scalar, we can really calculate everything. Either it is consistent with observations or it isn't. So it is fully falsifiable by, by, new, by the Higgs. So there are two mass eigenstates, so there must be a new scalar. There are heavy neutrinos. Uh, everything is calculable. Once we know the mass of the new scalar, everything is calculable. So it is fully falsifiable by LHC. And this necessary part of this conformal standard model is light and naturally weakly coupled axion called dark matter candidate. Thank you. <laughs>